Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data Webinar Series with host Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will be discussing sense and sensors from perception to personality. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce you to our series speaker for today, Adrian. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, I love that, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage area includes cognitive Cognitive Computing, Big Data Analytics, the Internet of Things, and Cloud Computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, Wiley, uh, 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and an MS in Computer Science from um, SUNY uh, Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get us started with today's webinar. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. It's always good to be here. And you know, I, I was uh, saying to people before this started um, that this is really kind of a fun topic, getting into perception and personality and things like that. So uh, I do want to thank Shannon for allowing me to do this as a two-hour webinar today. Just checking to see if you're still there. Okay. Uh, they wouldn't give me two hours, so we're going to try and do it all in, uh, in now I'm losing it. Doing it all in uh, 40 minutes and leave time for Q&A. So I'll start by uh, getting some definitions out there and then uh, get into the, the real meat of the, the presentation today. When we talk about sensors, we're talking about any sort of advice that detects the presence of a signal and reports it uh, to something else. So uh, we're all probably use sensors every day or are impacted by them, um, whether we think about it as a, a sensor or not. Just use this as a, a simple um, definition. So a sensor can be, uh, a sensor uh, is looking for um, the presence or the absence of some signal or a change in a signal. These things are event driven and they can either be stationary, so you might have um, something that's counting cars as they go past a, uh, a traffic uh, light, or mobile. We have lots of sensors in our smartphone. We're going to talk about that quite a bit today, uh, using the smartphone as sort of the typical platform for sensors. The first thing I want to do is uh, kind of establish that when we're talking about sensors, uh, you can't really consider uh, sensors uh, in isolation. You're looking at three things. Um, my little mnemonic device, sad. You have to have uh, algorithms and data to make the sensors have any value at all. And in each of the cases that we're going to look at today, basically we have a sensor, we've got some input signal that is going to, uh, either the sensor will uh, strip out the noise and uh, detect the signal, or there could be a second uh, processor out there. But basically by the time the sensor is done processing the signal, it's feeding data, uh, perhaps refined, if you will, into an algorithm. And the output of the algorithm is where you get your uh, result. You get something that's an actionable insight, hopefully. And you can substitute uh, analytics here when we talk about algorithms. What we're looking at is a way of taking data uh, that's typically uh, time sensitive. So it, the, the time element of the data is important uh, when something occurred. And we're trying to act on it uh, often in real time, although that's not a, a requirement. So you'll see in the press a lot of uh, numbers being thrown around. It's always billions or trillions of devices. Uh, if you're new to this series, uh, I typically try and uh, bring you some of the, uh, the relevant news items as we're kicking off. And here's one from uh, just last week um, where Ericsson says that by 2018, the Internet of Things, which is all sensor-based, and we've talked about that in, the, in a previous one, 
uh, IoT devices are going to overtake mobile phones as the largest category of connected device. And whether or not that's uh, true, whether 2018 is the year, uh, the important thing is here that we're looking at uh, billions and billions of devices. And uh, we're going to sort of make the distinction as I go through, um, through the slides today between a device and a sensor, because a device may have more than one sensor. Typically, you wouldn't have more than one device per sensor, but a device could be a phone, and we'll see uh, there are half a dozen different sensors in a typical smartphone. But if we're looking at it that we're going to have 28 billion devices, each of those will have perhaps multiple sensors, we're talking about a really big number. And since this is in the Smart Data Series, you probably wouldn't be surprised to find that the way we want to position this is, these are uh, tools, you can think of these as tools, uh, technology-based tools, that are going to help you leverage data and create value from it. So uh, the, the purpose of this one is just to kind of set the stage for how many there are. And if we're thinking about uh, 16 billion to 28 billion uh, devices, it doesn't matter if you're talking 16 or 28, that's a lot of devices. We're talking about more devices than people. So uh, people um, are interacting with multiple devices, systems that are talking to each other. Um, what I want to get into today as much as possible is looking at the interface between these devices and people. And we'll talk a little bit about machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communication. So with that in mind, uh, what I wanted to do is just kind of, even though we're going to be looking at some really fairly sophisticated um, usages, usage and applications, show that this is a, a quick, um, quick scan for Internet uh, of Things starter kits. And if you go out on, online after we um, have this conversation, you think, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe I'll try it. Uh, a lot of folks in the computer industry tend to start with a device called a Raspberry Pi, but there are kits out there uh, starting in the 20 or $30 range up to a couple hundred dollars to let you start to put something online and look at it as um, a sensor or a collection of sensors and then start to communicate. So I want to show uh, that even though we'll get into some things that are pretty uh, large and um, all-encompassing, you don't need to be uh, dealing with that to get started. This one from Credit Suisse, uh, I thought it was interesting because when people are looking at connected devices, when we talk about uh, the wearable industry, and that's what this slide was from, uh, it's really pretty variable. I'm going to use uh, a Fitbit as an example in a minute, but the, t the range of devices that are out there and the types of data that are being collected and the way the data is being used is what we want to get at today because the opportunity that you'll find today is so much uh, richer, if you will, than just a couple of years ago. With that, I always have to you know, go into popular culture. If you've uh, ever seen the TV show Person of Interest, which I guess is about to finish its run, this is an example of, some might say, uh, the ultimate scenario, or some might say it's uh, uh, sensor-based technology run amok, but their premise was that all of the uh, closed-circuit TV cameras in the world are basically connected. I'm not going to dispute that because I've seen some examples where things that uh, you wouldn't expect to be connected are connected. But the value, it's a real network effect when you have something like this and one system starts talking to another. And I think that's the, the part for, you know, the, the folks that often uh, come into our webinars are generally technology oriented. You're looking for how am I going to create a uh, new competitive advantage using technology. This is maybe the extreme case where you could connect everything. Uh, but the reality is that there are opportunities with almost any sensor to go beyond um, the, the small network that you start with. So to put it in, in context for um, IT, for enterprise systems and for uh, consumer systems, let's go and look at the actual interface. And here's one, here's about the simplest. Uh, so I want to make the point that when we're thinking about um, the interface for a system, 
how we think about that and how we implement it and what uh, parameters we allow really um, limits or constrains the types of uh, applications that we can build. And so what I'm saying here with the slide, how we imagine and implement the user interface, that's what constrains the human computer interaction. And in this case, it's a, about the simplest device. Um, there's no parameters going in. This is just a, a meter that um, I was telling Shannon before the call that uh, I stuck in my son's car over the weekend when his fuel gauge um, failed. And it's a calibrated ohm meter that is now acting that way. It's only got one signal in. You can't change that. So there's only one type of system that's going to be using it on the output. If we have a more complicated system, this happens to be a picture of the original IBM Watson uh, system that I took at the, uh, the Watson Labs, then we're looking at, uh, and where sensors come in, is you've got input devices and output devices. And by devices, I'm just saying anything that creates a signal, and that can be humans or machines. On the input or the output, we can be producing uh, input that's got to be uh, interpreted or um, put into a form that the machine can use, that's really this sort of upper left-hand quadrant is where we're going to focus today. But thinking ahead, uh, when we're dealing with humans, the output is also something that we want to make it more um, a, a rich environment, if you will. So. If you've seen uh, Watson on Jeopardy, just as an example, or seen the, uh, the ads with uh, Bob Dylan talking to Watson, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, you know that one of the features is that the input for this system goes beyond the traditional batch command line, GUI, et cetera. And now uh, it will take natural language in speech form. We're going to look at the difference between natural language in speech and natural language in text, but then also look as we get into more sophisticated um, types of input, where the system can process gestures and look at emotions. Today, we're going to really focus on uh, that as input, but maybe just to give you sort of a little hint as to uh, how systems are going to be using uh, well, gestures and emotions uh, to display um, a range of uh, desired outputs. I don't want to say that the machine has uh, emotions. Uh, we're certainly not uh, positing that at all. They don't. But if it's appropriate for the system to interact with the user um, by demonstrating some affect, then I think that we're going to see that um, the interaction is going to change dramatically. So having said that, I'll give you just a couple of examples here. In my two by two matrix, um, is the complexity of the data coming in, and this is the input data, uh, versus the type of um, sensor. So in this case, if we're dealing with stationary sensors, things that um, stay in one place and the events happen around them, a low complexity um, signal would be something that's just simply doing a count. Um, you drive over a strip or there's a uh, light beam that's broken as the car goes past, that's very simple. It's only one way to interpret it. A low um, complexity data signal in a mobile device might be uh, a Fitbit. Maybe it's uh, monitoring your pulse. Maybe it's monitoring um, blood pressure, acceleration. There are going to be a couple of sensors in some of these. But Typically, we're, we're dealing with uh, fairly crude, if you will, technology. But as you move up the stack, uh, high complexity for a stationary uh, device would be a video stream in a closed-circuit TV. Now, closed-circuit TV has been around for a very long time. If you've uh, been a regular visitor to London, you know that they've been monitoring um, just about every part of the city for many years. The, what's changed is now what we can do with that video signal. So it was always there. The, the rich data was always there. But now the, the systems that are analyzing that feed can do much more with it. And we're going to see an example or two of that. On the mobile side, uh, telematics, and we'll look at um, this in the, the automobile industry and how things are, are starting to uh, change. We'll, we'll put devices in. 
and sensors and you think of a device as being a complete automobile or maybe it's just um, a subsystem where it's being monitored in real time. And at the high end here, we'll have a smartphone. I mean, certainly we're going to see more and more sensors, more and more data being collected by smartphones. But right now, they are really uh, at the high end of what we can do with a mobile device. So I'm going to uh, move for a second into what I think of as the market signals that give me confidence in the, uh, the predictions that I'm going to make. And so we'll take a look at just a couple of uh, news items to show. So here we've got Google unveiling um, Google Assistant. So it's a, vir sorry, a virtual assistant that's a big upgrade to Google Now. And if you've been following the technology over the last couple of years, you probably saw things like um, uh, Google Glass come and go. And that was a device that had uh, multiple sensors in it. Uh, it was, uh, I don't want to, we could spend an hour on Google Glass, um, but the idea is they're experimenting, they're putting things out there, and Google, as you probably know, um, in most cases will know more about you than your parents or your children. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to go through a week um, without interacting with some app that feeds information into Google. So here we've got a, a virtual assistant, and one of the things that we'll see with a lot of these sensor-based devices is that they're acting as personal assistants. This is just one example. Uh, Ovidius, it's artificial intelligence on a stick. And here the idea is that we're, we're creating this, or they're creating this um, uh, intelligence or um, learning um, software that is an add-on to existing systems that will go into mobile devices. And so uh, what's cool here is that they're known for, uh, for thermal Im imaging, and now we're, um, we're looking at um, being able to add neural network capability to conventional systems. And these are all um, fairly recent, so this is a, an April, uh, late April announcement. Um, and this one, if, uh, if you've been with us in previous um, webinars, I've been talking about Qualcomm and their ZeroF uh, chipset for a while. Uh, it's a neurosynaptic or uh, brain-inspired architecture uh, chipset that goes in uh, telephone handsets, among other devices. And now, just uh, last month, they've opened that up to develop. So they've got the SDK kit out there now. So I think we're seeing this. There was one announcement uh, that I spent just a, an extra minute on, which is uh, just last week, the announcement of a, um, a partnership between IBM and Cisco, which is <clears throat> really where I, I think the world is going. And this is marrying the edge of the network devices uh, that Cisco has, and Cisco has um, you know, a good section, a good chunk of the, uh, the network market at the edge, if you will, with the analytics that um, IBM has developed with Watson Analytics. And this partnership now, um, what they're doing is bringing this to the edge of the network. So one of the issues when you're dealing with uh, a large network or with cloud computing is where's the data and where's the analysis being performed? And that's always been a... Um, uh, an issue for performance, and this partnership, you know, some of it's, I mean, it's been announced, uh, we're still getting data on things like pricing, but the idea is that with all of this data that's out there now, if you can process it as it's being captured rather than pulling it all in and then having to, uh, to do the processing, you're going to have a much more efficient um, system. And in some cases, not just more efficient, it's uh, feasible, but you can't actually do it unless you do it at the edge. And so this is kind of an interesting partnership, leveraging the, uh, the networking device at the edge capability of Cisco with the analytics uh, that Watson provides. And that was just, as I say, um, last week. I'm gonna take a quick look at some um, devices that you've probably either used or seen advertised and for this minute, I want to talk about telematics and specifically uh, instrumented vehicles. 
right now, a lot of what's being done with uh, telematics is being done by the insurance industry, look, trying to understand driver behavior by monitoring it. And we've seen this, uh, you know, certainly as uh, the parent of teenagers, I, I always appreciate the ads that say you can monitor how your teenager is driving. Um, but besides that, you can get feedback uh, from a device like this on uh, some things like um, how you drive, how you brake, uh, what uh, this one that was in here at the uh, New York Times. Um, the, oops, sorry, the one on the left is an older one. The one on the right is more recent. Uh, this was a uh, writer for the New York Times who tried one of these devices and got a, a um, their scorecard. What's interesting here is they have a grade for turns, and it's measured by looking at the accelerometer uh, and looking at the g-force, the force of gravity, as you're making turns. So you don't get penalized for making a lot of turns. You make you get penalized in this for making uh, turns abruptly, if you will. And the way it's being used today by the insurance company is to uh, offer incentives, offer discounts for people who get their scores down. It's almost, uh, well, it is analogous to the way they uh, they reward students with uh, better grade point averages, although I'm not really sure uh, where that fits in the world. But here, if you can see your performance and you get feedback, it's like biofeedback, um, you can improve if your goal is to be a safer driver or to be a thriftier um, motorist. So this has been around for a while. People are getting kind of used to it. Every car uh, manufactured in the last several years has had um, a port in the onboard computer system, just about every car, where you could plug something like this in. But typically, that hasn't been shared with a third party like your insurance company. The interesting part of this is, for me, that right now, uh, they promise the insurance companies are saying, well, you can use this and get a discount. We won't penalize you if you get bad grades. And in fact, on this one, it happens to be State Farm. Uh, my understanding is there's no grade lower than a C because they don't want to you know, offend anybody. Um, but there is the fact that that data, once it's out there, can be used for other things. Uh, the same sort of data could be used for uh, warranty information. So let's say you, um, you're you getting a, a good grade on acceleration and deceleration. Well, deceleration in particular, that means that you're probably going to uh, go longer or go greater distances before you need um, replacement brakes. You can take this same information that was intended for the insurance company, share it with permission um, with the company that's manufacturing the parts, and either maybe uh, offer you an extended warranty based on your driving uh, habits, or you could uh, do something like this to do predictive maintenance based on it. So one of the themes throughout the talk today is the same sensor providing the same data uh, may be analyzed in different ways as it's aggregated uh, for different applications. And to me, that's, that's where the real opportunity comes in. Um, one of the issues here, and uh, this is uh, in the one of the Chicago papers, yeah, Chicago, is that people are still reluctant to do it. It's like everybody wants um, a discount, but there's a, still a trust issue there. So um, we're, we're seeing um, the adoption. We're seeing people getting used to the idea of these sensors. Uh, what I think is kind of cool, you go in. Um, here, uh, this is a, a Tesla example, is that as cars become really rolling um, IT departments rather than you know, uh, having the technology as an add-on, we can see that the actual features of cars are changing based on the data they're getting uh, from these sensors, but also taking that data and now feeding it back into um, a closed loop system. So in the case of the uh, the Tesla here, uh, their latest software update, uh, this is like a complete mind shift if you've been uh, working with cars over the last 10 or 20 years or longer, where you're getting software updates in a car that will change the features of the car. And this um, 
this sounds like a promotion. I have nothing to do with Tesla. I don't have one. I don't have their stock. But they have a combination of cameras, radar, and ultrasonic sensors that now, based on their history, that they've been collecting data from all of these, now they can use that to feed into the other systems in the car and start to get closer to an autonomous vehicle. And that's kind of interesting because you know, if you bought one a couple of years ago, you may not have been thinking about it as, I'm going to be adding these features going forward, but it's all made possible by the analysis of the data and by the fact that you can now take uh, near real-time input from sensors and use that um, after it's been analyzed. You've got sensors, analysis of the data, the SAE that I talked about. Now you can use that to actually start to have the car respond uh, without direct human intervention. And I just, this is uh, one that I saw, actually one of my friends posted it um, just the other day. Uh, you can tell it's um, European because otherwise it would be predictive analytics here. It's uh, not July 6th, it's June 7th. It says 7-6-2016, where there was a race car driver that walked away from a 46G, right, the force of gravity times 46 times, impact. And two things about this. One, we know all of that because the car was fully instrumented. It had lots and lots of sensors that were keeping track of these things full time. Obviously, uh, it didn't have a collision avoidance system that would work um, in this, this um, environment. But what was interesting to me is they have a combination of sensors. Uh, they've had cockpit-mounted cameras um, th th that's new this year, and they are actually photographing or recording the driver at 400 frames a second. That is That provides too much data to be analyzed in real time, so that gets stored in what you would think of as a black box in an airplane. But some of the data is actually going back to the pits and being used for uh, changing, changing um, parameters uh, during the course of a race. So it, it's, you know, we, we talk about flyby or drive-by wire when you don't have a direct line from the gas pedal to uh, the injection system. There's an electronics uh, in the middle. Well, now we've got um, signals that are going out based on these sensors that are uh, all over the car going to a third party, which would be, in this case, the, the pit crew, the, uh, the management, and that's providing feedback that can go to the driver, but it could also go directly to the car. So we're getting much closer to autonomous vehicles, even in areas where uh, it may not be that obvious if you're just looking at it from the outside. All right. Um, I'm sorry if I'm uh, going fast today. We've got a, a lot of different examples that I wanted to get in. Uh, because the whole idea of sense, uh, sensors um, is just so cool. There are so many different ways to look at it. One of the areas that uh, people are talking about a lot right now, um, a, a term that's um, getting a lot of coverage, is spatial computing. And I would venture that uh, most of us have used the GPS um, at one time or another. And many of us have probably uh, seen the maturation of GPS uh, devices from being a separate device to being something that was perhaps uh, very expensive to have installed as an option in your car to being a free app on your phone. And it all comes back to the fact that there are these sensors uh, that can position you and now we can have applications that know where you are and know what's happening in the environment around you. And so th this happens to be just a, um, a Coursera course from uh, some folks at the University of Minnesota, but I just wanted to get people thinking about it, that we're really looking now at uh, time and space, space as in um, physical space, not as in outer space, um, as dimensions that are important uh, in creating value within an application. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do for the next little section here is look at uh, my favorite example, because most of us probably have one of these in our pocket, uh, sensors in the smartphone, what types of sensors there are, what they're being used for now, and get you thinking about how these things might be used uh, differently in the future. Because just like that uh, example with the telematics, 
once you start collecting data, you'll likely find other ways to use it. So in the iPhone, a typical um, modern uh, smartphone, these are some of the, uh, the sensors that are in there. You've got an accelerometer, uh, which detects motion. And if uh, I'll just use the iPhone because that's the one I'm most familiar with. And if you um, turn your iPhone from portrait to landscape mode, for example, uh, and you're using an application where you have to um, input text, the keyboard is going to switch. And it does that because the accelerometer is giving that information that you move things. Uh, the ambient light sensor is typically just used at this point to adjust screen brightness. But if you think about it, the ambient light sensor, uh, if you combine that with the geolocation um, system in there, now I know, I may know, I may be able to detect looking at uh, data from both of these, whether you're inside or outside based on the brightness, the time of day, and where you are. There's a barometer in um, the, the modern iPhone. I didn't realize that. But the barometer is used primarily um, you know, with, with the, uh, the basic apps to measure altitude. So if you have an iPhone and you use one of the health monitoring uh, apps and it says you've uh, gone so many steps, well, it's using the barometer to check the pressure to see as you're going up and down steps and not only that you're, that you're moving. Uh, we'll see in a second that that barometer can now be used for other things too. It's just a matter of taking that data and repurposing it. Uh, the gyroscope, cool. We, we start to rotate, you start to use your phone as uh, an input device for a game. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do with that. Right now, uh, the, the cool thing, in my view, is that for most of these, if you're a software developer, if you want to develop a new app, you have access to their APIs. You can go in and say, hey, I'm going to build something that will run on the iPhone and that will use this data. And the beauty of it is you can be creative and do something that's never been done before because you never had access to this kind of data. The proximity sensor is one that uh, if you use a phone, you, you've probably seen it in all the, uh, the ads. When you pick up the phone and you're going to put it um, to your ear, I can't actually remember the last time I did that with a cell phone, but uh, it turns off the screen because it knows, and I'll put that in air quotes, uh, it knows based on uh, what you're doing with the phone and the context that you now have it against your ear and you can't be looking at it, so it'll turn off the screen. The last one, of course, the, uh, the Touch ID fingerprint, which uh, was introduced a couple of generations ago. And now a number of apps that I use uh, give you the option of using that, uh, that touch as security for your app instead of putting in a passcode. But where this gets interesting to me is starting to combine the data from these sensors with um, a larger population, uh, likely to be anonymized, but now we start to crowd share this information, and again, hopefully with permission, all of a sudden, there's a whole new range of opportunities for that data. And now your data um, has new value. So it has um, what we think of as a, a network effect. Just to, to give an idea here, this is from uh, um, Qualcomm. Their location technologies that are in uh, many of these phones are currently in over 3 billion devices. When you think about that, uh, that means that if you're creating an app that will uh, take the data from the IZAT location technology, all of a sudden you have an opportunity of a potential market uh, that's very large, but also you can start to share data, you can start to gather data from a very large population. As we've seen in other uh, talks, that creates new opportunities. So what I'd like to do is uh, the next few, uh, few slides are actually screenshots from my own phone. And uh, if you were on, listen to Shannon and I chatting before the thing, you know that I'm moving in a couple of weeks, so I don't care that you know where I live. But um, if you look at this, We've got two screens here. This one happens to be uh, on the right is Uber. What's interesting there is 
when you use Uber, not only uh, does it the app um, get your location automatically using the sensors, but it will start to send you an active map that's using the sensor in your driver's um, phone. So you can actually see where they are and track them coming up the road and uh, verify this as somebody could be here in five minutes. Well, you can look and see uh, actually where they are. And in my case, uh, I, I often use Uber um, to come and pick up one of my kids to go do something when I can't drive them. It's nice to be able to actually see that and get that information in advance. The one on the left um, is a screen from Waze. And if you haven't used Waze, um, again, I've got no relationship with the company, but they are a, um, a navigation uh, application that crowdsources data. So when I'm driving and I'm using Waze to get somewhere, it's comparing the data from my phone with all the other people that are using Waze and adjusting uh, dynamically the route that it suggests based on uh, behavior. Uh, with Waze, what's kind of interesting is you can also actually uh, manually input information. So if you see an accident or a, um, a police car or some construction or even a large pothole, you can put that information in. And drivers in the area, as they pass through for a period of time, will get that. Uh, it can figure out, uh, calculate based on driver behavior that there is a uh, holdup in traffic and reroute trip, but it also has these um, these actual sort of hard alerts, if you will. And we'll see where that, that works and where it also has some unintended consequences in a minute. Um, this I, I just um, put down because one of the things that I think is really interesting when you get into sensors and uh, communicating systems, this is an alert I got the other day, and it said um, that I have a reservation at this restaurant. And yeah, okay, that's true, so it's reminding me. Uh, but it also said that there was a club ride on the 12th, and I had no idea what that was until I remembered that on Facebook, I'm still a member of a motorcycle group, even though I sold my motorcycle a couple of years ago. And apparently they were having a ride that I didn't notice on Facebook, but Waze was getting all the data from Facebook. Now that can get interesting, it can get creepy, and we'll look and see where, where it can just be annoying. I mentioned the barometer, uh, just show you one, one more app here, uh, Dark Sky. Their, um, their solution, their system, their app was uh, designed to give you very, very accurate information on the next 24 hours or even the next hour um, at a very tight location. So instead of turning on the TV and finding out that you know in your zip code, you're likely to get uh, rain in the next 24 hours. If you crowdsource um, this data and you're sending basically by giving permission, by using the application, you're giving permission for your phone to um, to allow the barometer data to be used by the app to be shared and then analyzed, all of a sudden you can get data that's accurate um, in a much more, much more accurate because you're getting real data um, and it, it's not based on somebody's opinion, it's not based on looking out the window, it's based on actual conditions. And the more data you have for an app like that, the more accurate it's going to be. Um, I just this one I uh, where I'm going to end on this section. Um, one of the things that I think is very cool uh, if you're thinking about apps right now for uh, mobile devices using sensors is that we can now have access uh, as app developers to the geolocation uh, sensors. And one thing that when I used to commute to um, to Manhattan, I always thought it would be nice to have an app that knew when I was at the stop before mine to give me an alert, uh, rather than saying, well, the train's supposed to get to my station at eight o'clock, uh, let me know at 7.45, because if the train's late, I'd rather just sleep. Well, now, uh, in this particular example, I, I had a leaky tire this week. I said, you know, when I get in the car, that's my location, tell me to check the tire pressure. 
and the one on the right is showing me that indeed when I got in the car, I had an alert to check the tire pressure. The next one is uh, just an example of how you would use it on the train. Norwalk happens to be the station before mine. You can go in, set an alert, remind me at a location. You can say when you're arriving or leaving, you want an alert. In this case, it said, when I'm arriving, when I'm driving, when I'm on the train and it's passing through Norwalk, that's when I want this uh, reminder. So it, it opens up. In this case, that would just be information from me. I don't know that that would be worth sharing with anybody. But now we want to say, as we start to pull all of this together, uh, in the title, we talked about uh, perception and personality. We know now that the phone or the app on the phone knows your location, your acceleration, all sorts of good stuff. My question is, at what point does it know your motivation? Because then it can give you much more personalized service. And the uh, little chart on the right is from one of the early talks that I did on um, cognitive computing. So right now we're doing a lot with machine learning getting into perception. Motivation is sort of, you know, down the road that we'll get to. But as perception improves, as we can get more than um, direct input uh, from a person giving either text or, you know, numbers, whatever it is, and we can start to look at things the way you and I would do if we were having a conversation, we can get more information. Well, then maybe we can determine motivation why are people asking this, and maybe we can respond appropriately. So um, you may have seen a, a diagram like this in some of the reports we put out. These are the different categories of um, technology that we cover at, uh, at Storm Insights. And the reason that I've highlighted the ones on the left, voice, gestures, motions, and text, um, natural language processing, is because that's on the human input side. And that's what we want to focus on. Uh, the ones that are in uh, bold, which is primarily uh, voice gestures and emotions in here, uh, the reason those companies are in bold is because we have a new report out that has uh, brief profiles on each of those. And if you're interested in that, just send me uh, an email after the, the talk, and I'll be happy to, uh, to send it to you. There's no charge for those. We're, we're building a database of profiles of companies in this area, and those happen to be the ones that uh, are in our latest report. Now, let's get into personality and um, sentiment and emotion and theme and concept analysis. One of the, uh, the, the things that uh, has been getting a lot of coverage in the AI world recently, uh, there's a, a new IBM commercial where Bob Dylan talks to Watson, and Watson says, I I've read all your lyrics, and I think that your main themes are um, like it's lost love and time passes. And th there's this whole debate in the industry about, well, is that really what what the um, what the themes were? My feeling, having looked at this and looked at at the criticisms, yeah, sure. Bob Dylan wrote a lot of protest songs, but if you're looking as a an intelligent reader who was reading this in 2016, let's say you're a college freshman and you were uh, listening to the lyrics during the Vietnam War. I think that Watson is actually doing uh, pretty much as good a job as um, a reasonably intelligent human based on the context and the words themselves. And I think that uh, this is kind of interesting because it fits with the whole idea of uh, sentiment and emotion analysis. There's a lot of work that's been done in that area. But here we're taking it up a level and saying, what is the theme or the concept? And where this fits in with sensors is as we start to um, build these richer human computer interfaces, now we can automatically, as we're processing input, try and understand what the person is doing, what the person we know where the person is if we, we have access to their phone. But by looking at the concepts, things that they're saying, but also um, looking for um, properties of the input that will give you an insight into uh, the sentiment that's being expressed or the emotion. Then we have a whole different range of options for what we can produce, what we can give, and what we can um, deliver to the user. So, one more slide here. Um, 
this one is uh, also in, in the IBM um, arena. This is from uh, Bluemix, where you can see that you have access to emotion analysis using natural language. In this case, it's, uh, it's using text. Um, but then we start to look at, uh, in, in Bluemix, you can go in and um, uh, build an app using their APIs. You can use it to analyze the content, understand what the emotion is, and have a different range of responses. You know, if you think about systems over the years, uh, one of the frustrating things is uh, if you say the same thing, uh, it's very deterministic. If I've got the same input to a computer, it's always going to give the same output. Well, I may be in a different mood. I may be in a different place. I may have different needs, but use the same words. And now if we can start to analyze uh, these other dimensions, we've actually got something pretty cool. So we're just going to look at two categories. Uh, the first fairly quickly looking at gesture recognition. And these are what, two, four, five, five of the companies uh, that are profiled in that report. There's a big movement that's um, probably most advanced in gaming where the interface allows uh, the system to uh, use a camera, which may be on your computer camera or on your television, uh, has a camera now in, in smart TVs. And you can influence the input um, basically, influence the input. Your input is the movement of your hands. And if you've ever played like a Wii game that had a controller that had accelerometer in it and, you know, play Wii golf or tennis or whatever it is, then moving that device uh, created a signal. Well, now this is doing the same thing, except you don't need a device because the camera is uh, evaluating your motion and doing that. And so this uh, particular example is from a company called EyeSight. But Again, we profiled um, a few of those in our report. This one is, uh, to me, the, the most interesting and the most promising is the idea of motion recognition or motion analytics based on uh, video. And again, we're, we're looking at um, several companies in this space right now. Uh, I'm just going to look at uh, Affectiva because it, I've um, gone through and done their demo and I can show you some data. Uh, again, the, this is not a client, this is not an endorsement. Uh, it's just showing you something that's representative of the advances in the industry and where we are right now. So they're selling a solution or a piece of a solution that uses your device camera, whether it's your computer or your, your mobile device like your, um, your phone, which giving it permission, will look at you as you're looking at the screen and try to understand the emotions that you are displaying on your face. So if you think about having a conversation with someone, uh, again, the same words are going to be interpreted differently if you're looking at their face. And I'll just give you an example. So I did uh, one of their demos, and you may recognize this. Uh, if you happen to have watched the Super Bowl in the U.S., there was an ad for beer that had a puppy, and everybody loves puppies. Basically, what happened in this demo is I watched the commercial while the application was watching me. And what this graph shows, this graph was looking, uh, you can see that I've selected smile on here. This is actually from me using their demo. And you can see that at this point uh, where it says 34 seconds in, there's a line there. That was one of the places that I smiled, and this is what was on the screen at the time. And if you think about that, in terms of that using the sensors, it's using the camera, it's using all sorts of data, and now it can aggregate it. Now, uh, obviously, if you're um, reading commercials, you'd be happy to use something like this to get information. But you could use it, uh, you could have a kiosk in a retail store. I'm looking up information, and I frown, and maybe you look at that and go, you know what, we've found that uh, if people frown at this point in our presentation, they're less likely to buy unless we offer them a 10% discount. Now all of a sudden it becomes interactive and it's based on your emotions or their per perception of your emotions. And this just shows the, the seven basic emotions that they, um, they tend to track. All right, uh, one more, which is, uh, I said earlier that you know, these are all on the input side. 
One of the things that I think is a very cool technology is coming out of um, University of Auckland and is being commercialized. Uh, this is a project called Baby X, where the the um, the interface to the applications of the building is using neural modeling. Uh, it's a, a virtual infant. It's actually modeled on the daughter of uh, Mark Sagar, who is leading the project. Mark has uh, some Academy Awards for his work on um, on Hollywood productions. But basically, the idea is that as you're interacting with an application whose interface is Baby X, the what you're being shown is reacting to you because you're seeing the baby, the baby is seeing you, and it can change. And obviously, uh, if you've ever talked to children, you know that you will change your facial expression, you may change your uh, voice tonality based on the feedback that you're getting. So now we're looking at interfaces that are using uh, neural models to change the way they look at you based on what they're seeing. And to me, that's one of the coolest things. So I know we're <clears throat> getting short on time. I'm gonna wrap up with what I call findings and recommendations, and just some general themes that, that I think um, would be good for us to, to look into and to discuss further in, uh, in some of the, the later webinars. So, number one, uh, I mentioned Waze, and I use Waze all the time. I used to have, uh, Dedicated GPS systems. We have one in uh, my wife's car that we haven't updated in years. We both just use Waze. And that's really cool. It's done a good job, and I've generally learned to trust uh, Waze. But it's creating some problems. And this particular example is in LA, where all of a sudden quiet neighborhoods are now uh, experiencing very high volumes of traffic because Waze is directing them to take these back roads that, or side roads that people have never done before. And the other thing, the consequence there is obviously it's, it's unpleasant to have your quiet neighborhood overrun by cars that are being directed by a computer. But now what's happening is people in those neighborhoods are getting Waze accounts and <clears throat> um, putting in fake accidents to try and get traffic directed away from them. So it's a very interesting uh, behavioral situation that uh, we're going to monitor. This one is not, uh, strictly speaking, sensor-based, but it's another one with uh, unintended consequences that as we're doing things with geolocation, it's really important to get it right. And I don't know if you've seen this news story. Uh, it came out a few weeks ago. If you're uh, dealing with IP addresses and you're looking for physical addresses, there are companies like MaxMind that will give you a physical um, address based on an IP address. The problem is they can't always tell where it is, and so they tend to approximate. And in this case, uh, if, they, if they can figure out what state you're in, they, but they can't figure out where the IP address is, they'll generally go to the center of the state. And if all they can do is figure out the country, they'll go to the center of the country. And that means that at the exact uh, longitude and latitude that they have determined was the center of the US, there's a lot of things defaulting to that physical address. So this poor uh, family living in a farm in, uh, in Kansas, according to MaxMind, is the home of 600 million IP addresses. So they've been getting people showing up uh, because people using IP addresses that are cloaked, uh, that are defaulting to this, uh, maybe doing some things that uh, have folks coming after them. And that's all I'm gonna say on that one. So the, the last point I want to make here, and pulling it all together, I was following uh, this Ford recently, and I was looking at it, and I stopped in traffic, and I realized on that bumper are four sensors um, that are being used uh, with the, the backup camera. I almost got run over the other day. I was at a gas station. Somebody was backing up, and I honked the horn, and they stopped, and then they backed up again, and I honked the horn, and they stopped and got out. It was because I was in my son's car and it was too low for their camera. Well, all of these sensors, in this case, all, all this, these four uh, backup camera sensors are doing is feeding information, it's a proximity sensor, to let them know they were about to run over something uh, if they were pointed in the right direction. But you can start to aggregate that and get all sorts of new opportunities. 
So the final bit here is where there's sensors, there's data, and where there's data, there should be sensors. So let's start looking at every uh, aggregation of data or every place that data is passing in a stream as an opportunity. And so the recommendation is, if you're in the IT industry, look at all your data sources for new applications and look to expand the data portfolio based on sensors. I think I'm five minutes over, but let's hand it back to, uh, to Shannon and see if I can answer a, a question or two. Uh, and anything that we don't get to today, I'll be happy to, to address um, by email. Adrian, thank you so much for another fabulous webinar. Very interesting information there. Um, I actually didn't know that Bob Dylan did a, a commercial with Watson. That's, I have to go, I'm going to go look that up <laughs> when worlds collide, right? Um, so uh, the most common question, of course, that we receive are people uh, wondering if they're going to get uh, questions a copy of the presentation. And just to remind everyone, I'll be sending out a follow-up email to all registrants by the end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested. Um, right now, everyone's being fairly quiet um, in terms of Q&A. <laughs> we have one comment that is uh, fascinating and well presented. I would love that. If you have yeah, any questions that you want to ask Adrian before we end the wrap up the webinar here, you can just minute in the Q and A in the bottom right there. Um, so six hundred million IP addresses. That's just interesting. <laughs> yeah, these, this poor family. Um, you, you know, think about it. If you're getting um, some internet scam and you want to you go off the deep end, you want to find out who's doing it, you look it up, and it turns out to they give you a physical address that's this farmer's lawn. <laughs> they ended up with, like, the sheriff guarding the place, and they, they really didn't understand what it was until uh, somebody dug into it and, and realized that. So that company, MaxMine, that provides physical addresses has now made the default, uh, like, the middle of a lake somewhere. But, <laughs> but they went through a, a really rough, rough period. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing how much everything is connected and, and um, um, certainly a lot of questions coming around security now in terms of all the sensors yeah, yeah. out there. Um, so as I said, if, if there are no questions, that's fine. Um, but if people want to get in touch, you'll get the slides. Um, mm -hmm. There's an email address for me on there. There's my Twitter handle, uh, Skype. We'd love to uh, have a more in-depth conversation about this with uh, with anybody who's interested. <laughs> uh, there is a comment that came in. It says, "Great webinar. It opened my eyes to great opportunities. I'm in, and I am in amazement uh, state. Uh, maybe going through the webinar one more time, I'd be able to ask questions. <laughs> 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 Absolutely." Well, yeah, and I'll include Adrian's information when I send out the follow-up email as well. So if you do think of questions afterwards, I can get um, you can certainly contact him afterwards. So, sure. Adrian, well, thank you so much for this great presentation. It really is just so interesting in, in where we're headed and um, with this these technologies and as a society and how the people are reacting to these technologies. It's uh, just fascinating. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for attending today. We uh, appreciate everything that you do and being engaged in everything that we do. Um, next month, we have a special event. Um, uh, it's going to be on July 13th, and at the this particular webinar series will be part of that event, Smart Data Online, and Adrian will be um, joined by Steve Ardiri to discuss modern AI and the future of work. We hope you can join us for that full day um, online webinar. Uh, we have a, lot, a great lineup for um, everybody in the terms of smart data. So, uh, and really look forward to you talking about modern AI, um, Adrian. And thanks for everything, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, Shannon. Take care. Cheers.